question is second reading, House Bill 4627. Mr. Merrill, you wish to be recognized? Sir. Mr. Merrill is recognized to speak on the bill. Um, and thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate it. And just to reiterate, again, uh, holding out hope against hope, I guess, that there would be some action, some understanding of the magnitude of the decision that DHEC made, the, well, not DHEC, the board of DHEC made, in reversing the decision that the folks, the agency made originally. My friends, it's time for the General Assembly to act, and I cannot, put, I cannot stress that anymore. We have to say that when it comes to the permitting of the Savannah River, when it comes to the competitive nature of the port, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to business for our maritime industry and the industry within South Carolina, the General Assembly is very much involved in this decision. We need to go forward. We need to tell them when we go to court, because we are going to court, that in order for them to, to grant this permit, they had to consult with the Savannah River Maritime Authority, the group that we established to help us in our negotiations with the state of Georgia. The idea that DHEC would unilaterally take it upon themselves to reverse that decision, that board took it upon themselves, is an affront to everybody in this chamber right now. It's an affront to the General Assembly. It's an affront to the people of South Carolina. I'll be glad to go on. I know there are a few people that want to talk, but my friends, let's take a very, very firm stance right now and say that we are looking at the future of South Carolina and we are committing to helping our business and our maritime industry. Um, so I do just want to say one final thing. I very much appreciate the General Assembly looking at this. I'm not trying to engage in any sort of hyperbole. I think this is that important. It is that important to our future. And on every single level, environmental, competitive, whether expansion, the cost, this fails. It fails. So let's please tell the courts, let's tell the people of South Carolina, let's tell Georgia where we stand as a state. And I think this will help do that. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. And Mr. Harrison, for your work on trying to right what is a terrible, terrible wrong that's uh, being attempted to be done to the people of the state of South Carolina. You know, Mr. Merrill's not trying to engage in hyperbole, and neither am I, but sometimes hyperbole uh, is appropriate. And this is probably one of those instances. Um, one thing Jim and I agreed on is that uh, we didn't want this to degenerate kind of what happened in front of the Senate committee. And, uh, you know, we could argue all day about fundraisers in Georgia and port influence from Georgia and Chamber of Commerce and speaking roles at conventions and all that stuff. But really, this is so devastating to South Carolina on the merits that you don't need to talk about any of that. And it's a mistake to talk about any of that. And as Mr. Merrill mentioned, on every level that you could an analyze this, it's a failure for South Carolina. Somebody mentioned the Jasper Port while Mr. Merrill was up here. And um, we asked in Charleston, when we had a hearing after this, this came about, we asked the director of the ports, what does this mean for Jasper? The answer, if this goes forward, Jasper is dead. Dead. Not only is the site spoiled, what is the, port, the purpose of the Jasper Port if this goes forward? Theoretically, you got a 50-foot, hopefully, uh, deep harbor in Charleston and 48 or 50 feet in Savannah if this happens. What is the purpose of the Jasper Port? Who goes there? Why invest hundreds of millions of dollars in that? So this kills Jasper. Let there be no doubt that the investment we've already made would be wasted and the plans for the future to bring jobs and quality of life to the people in the low country and throughout South Carolina by the enhancements and, and economic development that that project represents would be wasted and washed away. Um, a lot of people in this body are concerned about dollars and best use of dollars, whether they're federal dollars, state dollars, they're all tax dollars. And if you compare Savannah to Charleston in terms of port deepening, there is no comparison. The port of Charleston has already started its, uh, its required study through the Corps of Engineers to deepen the port of Charleston. And there's no doubt 
the numbers aren't closed. The Port of Charleston is the cheapest and easiest port to deepen in the South Atlantic region. Savannah's not even close. Deepening the Savannah port will cost approximately three times what it costs to deepen Charleston. Why would we, as stewards of tax dollars, embrace that kind of waste of money? But of course, the two biggest things are what this would do to South Carolina environmentally and economically. And I will say to you that no governor in the history of South Carolina, no agency in the history of South Carolina has ever made a decision this devastating to our own interests at home. The Savannah River is not in good shape now. And you've heard what it'll do to the Savannah River. It'll, 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 we, we had environmental uh, experts in front of our committee in Charleston. It will devastate the Savannah River. There are ecological uh, areas of the Savannah River that are unique to South Carolina that will be destroyed and they cannot be mitigated. There's nowhere else you can go to replace what will be lost. And so the environmental damage, and, and you know, what does this tell you? Everybody, when the, when the DHEC staff denied this permit, everybody was consulted. DNR, the port, Savannah Maritime Commission, Everybody was in agreement. We can't allow this to go forward. And that is the decision the experts made. S the state of Georgia was not even legally entitled to have that decision reconsidered by the board. They had no legal right to have the board take that up. It's a totally a matter of discretion. So the governor makes her phone calls and they take it back up. Well, we had testimony in Charleston from the former head of DNR currently DNR's representative on the Savannah Maritime Commission, that DNR was not allowed to speak at that DHEC meeting where the, the permit decision was overruled. We had testimony from the port director that they were not consulted. And as everybody knows, the Savannah Maritime Commission was not consulted. They filed suit because they weren't consulted. What does that tell you about the decision? To call it a decision is an insult to decisions. Calling something a decision implies there was thoughtfulness and that there was analysis and there was input. This was not a decision. If South Carolina is a sick patient economically with high unemployment, which I think we all agree we are and we're trying to do something about, and this decision, again, loosely, where the doctor prescribing a treatment, this treatment would be the, the equivalent of a bloodletting. Just cut the wrist and bleed the patient to death, because that's what we're doing if we allow this to go forward. And why do I say that? There are over 700, almost 1,000 companies in every county in South Carolina who import or export through the ports of Charleston. Almost 1,000 companies, over 700. The lowest estimate you'll ever hear is that one in every 10 or 11 jobs in South Carolina is tied directly to the port. That number's growing every year. I've seen estimates much higher, uh, as much as one in five if you count all direct and indirect. Um, and these are not just the BMWs of the world. You got businesses with 50 or fewer employees, probably over half of those businesses have 50 or fewer employees. These are the small businesses that are the backbone of the South Carolina economy. And this decision, again, using the term loosely, sells them up the river, no pun intended. Mr. Gentlemen, and this is a good time to kind of talk about the, out, the, the, the layout of what we've accomplished thus far, if I could get your attention. The bill as it stands, and this is important because we're going to be getting into this a lot uh, over the next few days, I think. The bill as it stands right now, after we adopted it last week, uh, creates a Department of Administration. It gives us legislative oversight uh, of, of, of the executive branch, which we need to have uh, so that we can do our duty, just as we've started to do with some of these hearings. It also... Um, it sends the 
former obligations of the Budget Control Board to different state agencies. All right, and that's what I want to talk about with you today uh, on this amendment, because it's important. When we create, in my mind, gentlemen, a department of administration should do administration. That's the goal here. The touchstone to me of what is truly administrative are things like managing the car fleet, dealing, renting the buildings to other state agencies or managing the buildings. That, gentlemen, is administrative stuff. And we ought to empower the governor through a department of administration to implement that, to do it correctly, hold them accountable if it's not. Uh, then there are things that are clearly, in my opinion, in the realm of the General Assembly. Fiscal matters to me are clearly within the realm of the General Assembly. That includes the right to allow deficits to be run. That includes the right to sequester or to say that funds shouldn't be expended. That is our job. That is why you are elected. It's been like that in this country for over 200 years. It's called the power of the purse, Mr. Chairman. It's the chairman's purse. We all get to have a say. Um, that is legislative. So there you, you have kind of the two obvious, to me, obvious powers and where they should be. But in the middle... There's a lot of things that reasonable people can say should be executive or legislative or some other uh, quasi way. All you have to do is look at the federal government to see this. You know, the federal government has many quasi administrative and legislative entities. Uh, they have the FCC, for example, which sets policy. And so it's not just an administrative agency. You have the Fed which makes financial policy. And so you don't have the president deciding what the rates will be for the country. Um, these things don't fall neatly into a department administration or the legislative. And so you try to grapple with the best way to deal with these things. There are some things that at its core, this General Assembly needs to have some influence over uh, so that we can do what our core function is. For example, a core part of what this General Assembly is charged with doing is redrawing its uh, lines for the Senate and the House and the Congress every 10 years. That shouldn't be sent to the executive branch, that department. The department that helps draw those lines should not be sent to the executive branch because it is not an executive function. It is a legislative function. And if the executive has control of the dem demographics, the precinct demographics, then essentially they have the control to dictate how uh, our reapportionment, our job, drawing lines, is done. There are other things that kind of fall in the middle. And what you'll see in this amendment and what you'll eventually see with the senator from Buford is a good faith attempt to grapple with those things. Um, so, in the current amendment to deal with many of those things, to deal with, for example, approvals of bonding, which is a financial fiscal matter, um, to deal with uh, across the board reductions when we're out of session, a financial matter, to deal with uh, approval of judgments, legal judgments against state agencies and the payments of those legal judgments, uh, to deal with debt and authorizing debt and saying that, that it's been carried forth appropriately, things that the Budget and Control Board formally do, it's not really appropriate for you to have one person in the executive branch saying empowered to do these things. And so to try to deal with that, uh, we created the... Um, State Financial Affairs Authority. Let me put it this way to you. Over the years, when I've talked about the need to abolish the Budget and Control Board, I've always said, look, there are some things that are administrative, purely administrative, and the executive branch ought to be empowered with the authority to carry those things out. But there are some things that aren't. They're policy. They're policy. And policy is supposed to be set by the General Assembly. We enact policy. We have influence over policy, uh, and then the executive 
executes that policy. Some of these things are policy making decisions and I always said you need to have some authority out there who can weigh in on making policy decisions in public with a vote that has input from the General Assembly and from the executive branch because they don't fit neatly within either of these two spheres. And so the bill as it exists today has what's been created which is the State Financial Affairs Authority. It doesn't do any administration. It doesn't do the types of things the Budget Control Board did with managing the fleet and, and um, you know, overseeing uh, the implementation of many of the, the executive programs. But what it does do is have authority over some of these policy making decisions that frankly need to be made in public view with give and take, with a vote being taken, with inf in, uh, uh, influence from the General Assembly and influence from the executive branch. Uh, this amendment that Senator Hutto has today says that, um, that the when the executive director of that entity is hired, that that executive director shall go through the advice and consent of the Senate. I don't know. Um, I certainly did, but I hope a lot of you gentlemen took home with you over the weekend the... Um, 169 page side by side, which was prepared by judiciary staff so that everybody could have a clear understanding of two different starting points in this debate. Um, we have on the desk right now that we're working from an amendment that was proposed last session uh, by Senator Massey, Senator Shaheen, and myself that passed, I think, 44 to nothing. And um, so that's one version. Uh, another version is, is one that I've worked on with Senator Massey, and I've also worked on with the governor's office over the summer and over the fall, um, that, that does provide Senator from Charleston, as you indicated, a, a different starting point. And, and I would agree with what the Senator from Kershaw has to say. I think there's, there's more similarities in the two than there are differences, but there are some important differences. And I guess procedurally my point would be that if the work we did in terms of looking through this side by side and then looking at the two different starting points is to have any value, we ought to be taking up my comprehensive amendment now because what's going to happen if, if we go ahead and just proceed with the intervening amendments that are before my amendment, this side by side is going to cease to be accurate. It's going to be a moving target. I mean, certain things are going to be changing and this body is not going to have as clear um, an idea or picture in their mind as to what they're choosing from. And so what we're going to have to do each time is update and amend this side by side so that this body knows exactly what the differences are. Now, I, I want to go ahead and point out a couple of the, um, of the key differences between the amendment, which I'll just simply call the, the Massey Shaheen Amendment and opposed to my amendment, um, and, and as to why I think my amendment is a more appropriate starting place. You know, first of all, it, it, procurement is, is a big issue. Um, in 47 or 46 other states in the nation, procurement is in the executive branch. It's an administrative function. I mean, there are savings that you can achieve through uh, the procurement process, demand aggregation, outsourcing. Um, it's not about picking winners and losers. It's about economies of scale. And I agree from the Senator from Kershaw that if you do put procurement in the executive branch, we ought to have safeguards, and, and safeguards are built in uh, to my amendment. You have a procurement panel review, you have an appeals process, you have an auditing procedure that's in place, you have a notification process in regard to large um, uh, procurements. Um, so we can have that discussion about safeguards. But as a threshold matter, um, procurement or, or the buying of goods and services to execute and to fulfill the law is essentially an executive function by its very nature. And so creating a state financial affairs authority and having it comprised of the same members that the Budget Control Board is comprised of and leaving with that SFAA procurement and leaving with it bond authorization and leaving with it um, various functions, um, we're deceiving ourselves if we think we're abolishing the Budget Control Board because all we're doing is taking it, giving it another name and leaving very important powers um, with the entity. And, and going to what the senator from Sumter had to say about the Budget Control Board um, and its virtues or, or, or lack of virtue, 
Uh, the only thing I can say is I participated in, in a number of panels throughout the state in the recent years that talked about the Budget Control Board. Um, and, and I've heard governors, uh, Democratic and Republican governors, Governor Riley, Governor Hodges, um, saying the Budget Control Board was not an effective way of executing the laws and resulted in waste. I've heard Republican governors say the same thing, um, and there have been numerous um, uh, academic studies looking at this Budget Control Board, um, noting that it is the only such entity uh, in the United States. Um, the South, state of South Carolina is the only state that has a Budget Control Board um, that essentially has members of the legislative branch participating in the execution of the laws. And it is also, quite frankly, um, unusual in that it also discharges certain legislative functions Senator from Sumter, such as deficit recognition, um, which I think everybody in this body would recognize um, or agree is a legislative function, that uh, the Budget Control Board should not be authorized to uh, enable an agency to run a deficit. That's an essentially an appropriation function which belongs to the legislative branch. So it, it, is, it is important, I think, to start from the right um, starting point. And procurement's one of those areas uh, in, in which I think it's important. Uh, another would be um, what I just mentioned, deficit recognition. Um, and what's before us right now, um, the State Financial Affairs Authority would have the same deficit recognition powers that the Budget Control Board has, the same ones that the Senator from Charleston, Senator McConnell, um, railed against last session, rightfully so, um, in that it is a usurpation of a legislative function to authorize a deficit reduction. Um, my amendment properly places that deficit recognition authority with the legislature where it belongs. Um, in terms of bonding authority, um, that is quintessentially uh, a legislative function. My amendment um, specifically states that the amount of bond authorizations have to be approved by this General Assembly in a separate bill. Uh, not only the amounts, but the areas. Um, there is much more legislative control over the bonding process in my amendment than is currently the case, um, or is the case with the Massey-Shaheen Amendment. And so that's an instance of where I think as an appropriate departure point, we have to have the root of that bonding authority placed in the legislative branch. It does not belong um, with either the Budget Control Board or with the State Financial Affairs Authority. Uh, in, in regard to retirement and public benefits, um, the document we're now working from creates a transition committee um, and nine out of the, or eight out of the nine members, or seven out of the eight members on that transition committee that will be deciding retirement policy and public employee benefit policy, and this is very important, are, are state employees or retirees. So seven out of the eight of the individuals who will be making decisions in regard to retirement public benefits during that transition process are state employees and retirees. Um, I, I think that the temptation to have the state assume a greater share um, of those particular benefits is going to be too great when you have seven out of the eight members benefiting, and, and I think that's extremely dangerous. Um, I think we need to go ahead and establish not a transition committee and essentially giving to the individuals who benefit um, from the program authority over that program. Um, I think we need to go ahead and do what Senator Ryberg has been working on, which is creating uh, not a cabinet agency. This is not create a cabinet agency. It creates a standalone board of trustees um, and does so in a way as to establish fiduciary duties, um, you know, education thresholds, um, auditing requirements. Um, it's very comprehensive in regard to not only how the retirement system and employee benefits are managed, but also how investments are managed. And um, the draft that I have goes into much more detail um, in regard to that matter than does what's currently on the desk. 